Today, realagriculture.com comes to you from the Climate Change Symposium at the University of Guelph. Uh, we're pleased to be joined by USDA plant physiologist Dr. Louis Ziska, whose research focuses on climate change, weeds, and, and future problems for plants. And uh, so welcome to realagriculture.com. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, let's start it off uh, talking a little bit about your presentation today. And, and I guess first of all, uh, what impact is climate change having on weeds and, and their impact on crops? There are two things, really. The first is that in many instances, weeds are uh, limited in their geographic distribution by temperature, by weather. And as the temperature changes, as we see, for example, warming winters, then those constraints that have not allowed weeds to go into new areas will allow the, at least the possibility of them moving into areas where they may not have been before. So as a farmer, you should be prepared for seeing a shift in weedy species that uh, were likely to occur, are occurring now, and likely to occur in the next 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean in terms of crop production? Well, it means a couple of things. Um, one of the management tools that you have is knowing what uh, application to apply for a given weed species. And as those weed species change, then your management strategies are going to have to change uh, concurrently as well. So it's possible that some weeds may move north, and as they do so, their range may be subtracted in the south. It's possible that some new weeds may be coming in that you haven't seen before. Um, so it is going to be a challenge for farmers to keep track of what's coming in and also to keep a, a sort of a, a third eye out, if you will, for understanding what new impacts those, those new pests may have for crop uh, production. Right. Now, in, in your presentation today, you noted that atmospheric CO2 has increased by 22% since the 1960s. Right. Now, what impact is that increase having on crops and weeds, and, and does it favor one over the other? Well, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things you need to understand at first is the fact that CO2 is essentially the source of carbon for photosynthesis. And the second thing you need to understand is that, with any res as with any resource, it doesn't always favor uh, the crop or, or plant that you would like it to favor. So in some instances, we do see, in fact, weeds uh, out-competing crops. Um, in fact, probably in the majority of instances, that's what occurs. Now, we think that's due in part to the fact that weeds are genetically diverse, that for any one monoculture of a crop that you have, there are probably eight to ten different weed species that are being uh, growing in conjunction with that crop, and they're very genetically diverse. So that when you change the environment, in this case you're changing the amount of CO2, that the chances are that you're going to be favoring the weeds over the crop, and therefore crop losses may be accelerated. What, is, what, what does that tell us about the future? Is that going to be a bigger challenge going forward for producers? It is going to be a bigger challenge going forward for producers. Weeds are... Um, the, the most significant limitation on crop production globally. And probably more effort is spent by the human race in terms of controlling weeds than any other pest out there. So having weeds that are going to benefit more from rising CO2 levels or from warmer temperatures absolutely is going to be a significant effect with respect to, to weed management for the future and maintaining crop yields. Now, one thing you mentioned as well uh, in, in some work on, on glyphosate, and obviously resistance um, <coughs> has become an issue across North America. Um, it's a real concern for producers. Um, is climate change and CO2 levels playing a role here as well? I know you've done a little research. We've done a little bit of work on this in this area, and I think more work is being done. Um, probably the major effect is not related to climate change per se. It's related to overuse of, of certain chemicals. And what we find, however, is that with climate, uh, you're going to see a decrease uh, in the efficacy of some chemicals. And that's due in part to the weeds essentially being able to respond more to CO2 and climate than the crops. We know that the best time to spray for weeds, for example, is when they're in the juvenile early stages. But the time period in which they're in that stage is likely to be shorter if, in fact, they're responding more to CO2. Mm. So that has a change or a negative effect with respect to, to the efficacy of the, of the chemical. 
Uh, there are other changes as well. For example, with perennial crops like, or perennial weeds like Canada thistle, when you have more roots below ground, then spraying with the same recommended dosage may not in fact kill Canada thistle. You may have to spray more, you may have to increase the dosage. So how you cope with that in the context of what is essentially happening with respect to more and more resistance that's occurring because of overuse of the chemical is just one more facet that's being laid on top of what's already a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. what, about, um, what about weather? Um, we've seen you know, across North America this year extreme weather. Um, where does that play in here, and, and is there a relationship with, with, with CO2 and, and how weeds are going to behave? Well, the relationship with CO2 is sort of indirect in that it's one of the things that's driving the weather extremes that we're seeing. Um, and as with most weather extremes, if you're a farmer, timing is everything. You need to go out there and take care of any pest problem that you can. Uh, but if an extreme event comes up, then, of course, that interferes with your timeline. You may not be able to get there in time to control a given pest population or a given weed population. Um, so there are some uh, concerns about being able to get out there in a timely fashion. But the bigger concerns, of course, are more related to crop production directly. Too much rain uh, or too little rain is going to have a much bigger effect in terms of your production than anything that weeds or, or pests are going to do in the short term. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the future here, um, and obviously, you know, the challenge of weeds. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation over the years. Um, what types of innovation, where's the innovation need going to have to be to give producers the tools to manage weeds going forward? Well, that's an excellent question, and I think that one of the, the innovations that we have in mind is to be able to use weeds actually in a positive way, and here's what I mean by that. Um, Many of the worst weeds that you face as a farmer are essentially wild versions of the crop that you're growing. If, uh, you know, oats and, and wild oats and wheat, for example, or um, uh, wild rice and rice, or uh, nightshades and, and uh, potato, that they're genetically related to each other. Uh, and they often have the same life cycle as your crop, and that's what makes them such pernicious weeds. But at the same time, if these are plants that are being able to adjust to climatic change, to rising CO2, why not utilize them as a, as a unique source of genes and breeding as a means to begin to adapt the crop mm. to climate change? For example, in, in wild rice, we see lines of wild rice that flower at night when the temperature is much lower, so they're not sus uh, susceptible to the high daytime temperatures that that cultivated rice might be vulnerable to. So here's a way of looking at the wild lines as a means to begin to adapt to climate change. And in, this is not new. It's something perhaps that we've forgotten in terms of traditional breeding, but uh, it was a wild relative of potato that was used to come up with phytophthora resistance as part of the means to adapt to the Irish potato famine back in the 19th century. Um, often when new diseases or new pests arrive, we can turn to the weeds as a uh, beneficial source of genes to begin to adapt the crops to that new change. So that's something to keep in mind as, an, as a new way of innovating, uh, new ways of adapting to both CO2 and to extreme climates. So in this case, the, the problem becomes the solution? Possibly. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a... It's a the old adage of turning uh, lemons into lemonade, and that's what we hope to be able to do. Well, thank you for your insights today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome.